you so much for coming. Uh, um, it's a huge, huge honor for me to get to introduce um, Dr. Mary Jane Rothran today. It's been my experience. I've been at three uh, universities during my career. I, I started at UCSF, was then at Georgetown, and now UCLA. And my experience is that we always tend to undervalue our wonderful colleagues that we see every day. And so um, this feels like an opportunity uh, for us to uh, value um, a particularly unique and well-deserving uh, colleague. Um, Dr. Rotherham designs, develops, and implements groundbreaking programs for youth all over the world. And, and that is extremely unique. A lot of people might do one, like develop a program, but to actually stay with it and figure out how to implement it widely is, I think, a huge strength of Mary Jane's. Uh, she has been PI of over 75 grants, which is amazing. Um, and I think at one time was had more NIH dollars than any other female in the U.S., I believe. Yeah, amazing. Yes, yeah, amazing. Um, she's published nearly uh, four and probably over 400 articles now that uh, include truly seminal articles on HIV, uh, mothers with HIV, and innovative care for youth um, in this country. She served on national boards and review groups that have truly shaped HIV prevention and intervention in the US and abroad, as well as uh, innovative services for youth. Um, most people who are that productive, we could just stop there. But I really want to say that a unique feature of Dr. Rotherham is that she is generative. She has begun a number of international programs, um, including places like India and Uganda, and then passed them on to others. <clears throat> I have uh, actually been lucky enough to be the recipient of uh, working uh, with her colleagues in Uganda and um, realize how hugely loyal they are to her because of the important work that she's done in Uganda. And uh, probably uh, none of you knew, but if you go to one of the worst um, slums in Kampala, Uganda, you will find a dormitory. And across the side of it, it says the Dr. Mary Jane Rothran House, uh, which exists truly for girls, many of whom have been trafficked and led, led difficult lives, um, a place of refuge, um, thanks to Dr. Rother and Porus. So it is my uh, tremendous um, uh, pride, with tremendous pride that I introduce Mary Jane to speak about resilience among children and adolescents coping with poverty and disease. Because last Friday, the National Academy of Medicine came out with a special report on the effects of poverty in this country. And for the 250 million kids worldwide under the age of five, and then you get that down to only 12 million kids in the United States, it's four to five and a half percent of the population that are in serious trouble and that are going to cost us $1.1 trillion a year because they're not resilient. Resiliency is talked about as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, and threats. And it's supposed to be dynamic. It's considered within individuals. You have to define it over time within context, and it's multidimensional. And there have been thousands of studies Child development just had a, a special issue a few years ago. And among those thousands of studies that started after World War I, there are five, five whole longitudinal studies and one in a low and middle income country. And that was in Afghanistan about over the last five years. So today I want to talk about resiliency, but in the context of intervention and um, I direct one of the centers in the MPI, and one of my 
research themes for the last 20 years has been about the importance of evolving interventions, and we do a lot globally as well as domestically, and have been many places throughout the, the world. We have 22 evidence-based interventions that are certified by CDC or SAMHSA or the APA as an evidence-based intervention. And um, in the beginning, the first really certification of evidence-based programs happened in 1987. There were 14 such programs. I had one of them. Another was Head Start, another was David Olds that many of you would know would be home visiting. Mine was assertiveness training in schools. Never did it again, never replicated it, but social skills training has certainly become a huge vein in the United States. But I think of, we're in the middle of writing a chapter for the Oxford textbook. Originally, our focus was on evidence-based interventions and most of psychiatry went there. But then to think of it in a public health way, it was community level evidence-based interventions. And what you had were the big heart trials that were successful and the community level smoking trials, which bombed. And in fact, that led to the next generation of interventions, which are structural. And so the best example of that, that I think is the 30% tax on cigarettes in California, and you get a 30% reduction in smoking. And so our own work has evolved in that direction. We have evidence-based programs certified. There are now 13 agencies certifying evidence-based interventions. We've moved on to community level trials, but where do I see the future? It's all in structural interventions. And it's needed because those 250 million kids, if you're in the United States, four out of five kids are gonna do okay and they'd be defined as resilient. Pretty much the same in all high income countries, except if you looked at like the UK, and if you were a refugee, it's gonna be 40%. And if you go to Africa, I'm gonna to show today, it's gonna to be less than 20%. And if, as we all know, adverse events, most of us have one adverse event, more than two thirds in this room. But if you have four, you're gonna live 20 years shorter. And seven out of the 10 top causes of mortality are related directly to the number of adverse events you have in your life. An adverse event being somebody with a, living with somebody with a mental illness, having a big loss, trauma. Adverse events have all kinds of consequences, both physiological, for both health and mental health consequences. And if we look at what are these big seven out of 10 that are gonna kill you, if we look at what are the predictors, what are the pathways to those negative outcomes, whether it's HIV, serious mental illness, drug abuse, incarceration, the pathways are all the same. The predictors are all the same. They just get expressed in different ways. So we were lucky enough, I was lucky enough to get to go to Africa um, about 10 years ago. And Africa is a place where only one in five are thriving at best. Widespread poverty, but also South Africa, HIV rates are between 26 and 40%. Alcohol use, 25% among women, about 85% among men. That's serious alcohol problems, not just use. FASD in first grade, fetal alcohol syndrome, 6%. That's after 10% of the kids have already died. And those would be kids that would be overrepresented of having fetal alcohol syndrome. Intimate partner violence, a quarter of the population. Jail for the men, more than 50%. We have a randomized controlled trial going on in 24 neighborhoods right now. It's 63% of the young men under the age of 30 have been in jail. Low birth weight infants, 17% and food insecurity, 40%. On a daily basis, if you don't share with your neighbors, you don't get when you don't have any. South Africa is a place where hopefully maybe we could make a difference. So 10 years ago, I, and I've ha we have a history of partnering with great community collaborators. And in this case, we went to Polani, 
an NGO that started in the late 80s when the townships were first being funded, and Polani, Stellenbosch University, and UCLA formed a partnership. We had a lot of good people from here, but I, the one I'd really want to mention is Mary O'Connor, because we had funding from NIAAA, and we got a lot of funding from other people along the way. The most recent Welcome Trust funded us in November to call together all the international cohorts that are longitudinal intervention cohorts. There are 16. So this cohort is one of 16. There are only 42 longitudinal cohorts globally in low and middle income countries. And the program that we partnered with is about mentor mothers. It's a different word for community health workers. And they're at the core of the program. You see a woman on the right with a scale. That's the entry strategy. I knock on your front door, and why would you let me in? Because I'm going to weigh your kid and let you know if they're healthy. So, um, and we evaluated a paraprofessional home visiting program among um, 24 neighborhoods in the slums or the townships of South Africa. And what was unique about this agency were five things. First of all, they only hired women who were role models in their community. And how did you determine that? First of all, you had to have good social skills. Everybody had to interview you. And then we went to your house. Was the house organized? Did you have things away? Or was it a total mess? How were your kids doing? Then we did training, both in the classroom, but also in the field. You're going to shadow other community health workers. There's going to be an active intervention. You've got a job to do. And every two weeks, you don't know what day, we're coming and we're seeing what's happening. There's a coordinator's coming and seeing what you're doing. And you have to write down stuff. Once we became involved on mobile phones, you had to tick what you covered that day, what strategies, what skills you used, and did you think you made a difference? Three whole questions. And with these five innovations, we spent a year matching 24 neighborhoods. So these were the dimensions that we matched on. How, how many were shacks versus how many were actual houses with a wall and a roof? How far were you from medical clinics? Um, the biggest one, especially since we were funded by NIAAA, how many bars were there in the neighborhood where people hung out? We had natural barriers and we did random street intercept surveys. Could you get me some water, Jeannie? Street intercept surveys that said when people, all of the townships in South Africa are made from people who migrate from the Eastern Cape. So in that Eastern Cape, we did street intercept surveys. How long have you lived here? Where'd you come from? And then we mounted a randomized controlled trial. We have in the can the 90 month follow up. We picked up 98% of all pregnant women in these 24 neighborhoods over a period of about 15 months. And we just finished 90 months. The kids are between seven and a half to eight years of age. We have an 84% follow-up rate. So it ranged from 86 to 84%. And one third of those families and those kids are over in the Eastern Cape, about 500 kilometers away. And we have to go search them out. There have been a lot of publications from this, probably 30. And it's cost effective. Um, came out in Health Affairs last year. And this only evaluated three of the outcomes. But to kind of summarize the overall outcomes, if you, we went to all mothers in the neighborhood. This was HIV funded. And the HIV rate was between 26 to 30%. So not everybody had HIV, but if we had only gone to HIV positive moms, we would have been thrown out of the community in a week. So we went to everybody. So it's a community level intervention. And if you were in our intervention group, you breastfed your kid longer. You used a single feeding method is what everybody cared about. Your kids were uh, heavier and longer. You had less diarrhea, better caretaking, fewer low birth weight infants, 
fewer hospitalizations for your kids. In the intervention group, we had 13 surviving sets of twins, none in the control group. That wasn't necessarily good news because those kids don't do very well. But if you were, um, if you were in the control group, you didn't make it to childbirth. And using the sticky cake kind of observational videotape, mothers in the intervention had greater sensitivity towards their kids, which lead, led to things like more social support and issues like that. If you were positive, you had a 50% higher rate of adhering. There's six things you have to do if you're HIV positive. Like you have to take drugs the last six weeks of pregnancy, you gotta get nabarapine at birth, you gotta give um, Cipro to your kid for six weeks, you gotta get your kid tested. There's six tasks, 50% increase in those tasks. Your kids were far less likely to be stunted, more likely to not have birth complications, more, five times more likely than for that you'd tell your partner about the baby and tell, he would tell his family. That's how you get a baby acknowledged in Africa. And three and a half times more likely to be breastfed. These were pretty good. Surprising, because this was a relatively brief intervention. Um, they went, everybody carried mobile phones. So we knew when they went, how long they went. Average time was 31 minutes. Average number of sessions from pregnancy to uh, two years of age was about uh, 18. These show the data, is there a laser up here, do you think? These show the data of the mothers. Where did we have the biggest impact? It wasn't just overall. These are the antenatally depressed moms. And if you see the bottom line that's in black, those are the control group depressed moms, the kids of the moms in the the depressed group, control moms who were depressed, their kids are failing to thrive. They're becoming stunted. So if you're depressed, that black line shows how tall your kid is. Your kid's getting stunted over time if you're antenatally depressed. But if you're in the intervention group, you look just like normal kids. Reducing depression was not part of our target. But the message to the mom was, I don't care if you're depressed, you have to take care of your kid. I don't care if you're depressed, you have to hold your kid, you have to talk to your kid, you have to look at your kid. I don't care if you're depressed. I don't think they were like, I don't care. I, I, we didn't train them to say, I don't care. But we didn't train them to say, let's do happy things. Let's, it was about, you still have to keep functioning Whatever goes on in your life, how are you going to problem solve it to take care of your kid and yourself? And what you can see is these are over 18 months, a significant difference at both 6 and 18 months. But also, their IQs were higher. So if on the left-hand bar, was your kid's IQ on a Bailey at 6 months, at 18 months, on a Bailey at 18 months, was it below 85? That's two standard deviations below. The blue bar is the kids in the intervention group with an antenatally depressed mom. The orange bar are the kids in the control group with an antenatally depressed mom. So you got fewer depressed mothers, even though depression wasn't of our target. And at three years, finally, we got a significant difference in depression. Mothers were less likely to be depressed, their kids were less likely to be stunted, hospitalized, and they had better vocabularies. And at five years, we got in a, both during pregnancy, and this was a, a replication of Mary O'Connor's very brief single session intervention. It reduced drinking during pregnancy, and for the mothers in the control group, those that were drinking doubled down and were drinking twice as much in the month before the baby was born. I didn't show you that result. But at five years, this is a difference. You can see that they start di divergent paths at about three years, and it's significant by five years. So you have far less alcohol use. I don't know what's going to happen in the 90-month data. Um, we haven't looked at it yet. But today, I wanna, the real story is not, OK, it worked. 
but they aren't earth-shattering results. But let's look at resiliency and how would we define it? Because in these whole six longitudinal studies, it's almost always defined on the basis of behavioral symptoms. So the behavioral symptoms, if you're really lucky, might be a CBCL. More commonly, it's the strengths and difficulties questionnaire at a single point in time. So we used a criteria, especially because we had almost all these kids. There were only 22 families that we lost from birth onward. We, even if we missed you post-birth or six months, we got you back. So what, if you were normal at every time point, and we looked at what the theory said, was your growth normal, was your behavior normal, and was your cognition normal? And so we used the WHO growth standards, less than two standard deviations in height and weight. We used the CBCLs that the mothers did at every assessment. And for cognition, at 18 months, we had the Bailey, then we had the Kaufman, Peabody, and the Clancy measure, which is supposed to be a culture-free measure of, of uh, executive functioning. Bottom line, 17%. <coughs> By five years, 17% were still resilient, despite widespread poverty, 40% food insecurity, multiple partnerships, women almost always have a partner, but only 25% of women live with that partner. And on what basis did the kids not be, were they not resilient? It's almost always on cognition and growth. 27% got kicked out because their cognitive scores were more than a standard deviation below the norm. And they got kicked out on the basis of growth. To, but for growth, we used the criteria of two standard deviations. So one out of five kids resilient at five years. One part of that story is the huge loss in cognitive potential. This is not a finding that's been observed. But again, there aren't very many longitudinal studies of kids that get followed repeatedly over time. At 18 months, the Bailey scores averaged 101. It was a traditional Bailey done by people who had been well-trained. By five years of age, the mean IQ for everybody was 83. So there was a huge drop-off in cognitive potential during that time. And if you looked at growth and other measures, it also dropped off right at around three years of age. So we had, you know, 83% resilient, uh, non-resilient kids, 17% resilient. Well, what were the predictors from the mom's point of view? Because unlike what we would have predicted, poorer moms, people with less income, People with more food insecurity, try to explain this to a viewer, were more likely to have resilient kids. Those were atypical findings. That's why I circled them. The rest, if you did not have a partner, then you had a resilient kid. And if you had fewer people in the home. So you expect that two-parent families do better, not in South Africa. It's better if the mom's on her own. Mothers who were less depressed, what were, we didn't measure major depressive disorder, but if you take the case and the scales on either the Hopkins measure or the Edinburgh measure of depression, they were the same. Alcohol was the same. Breastfeeding was the same. Things that you expect to be predictors were not. But the, it was surprising that income and food insecurity did predict resiliency. Less income poorer you were, the better your kid did. Did HIV, this is an infectious disease that is highly, highly stigmatized in South Africa, even today, even though they have 40 million, it's the country with the largest HIV in the entire world, um, more than six and a half million people. It, those who have HIV have less money, 
more physical illness, they're more depressed, they use more alcohol, and plus they have screwed up immune functions. And these kids, there's a huge literature now on um, HIV exposed but uninfected kids. Because now if you're a mom with HIV, less than 2% of your kids are gonna get, become infected. But your children have been exposed in utero to HIV, and a lot of people hypothesize all these negative things for those children. Well, it did not influence the resiliency. And the po HIV positive moms, 19% of their kids were resilient versus 16% of the kids of the mothers who were negative. And if you looked at a survival curve, the intervention did not help resiliency. It was just the same. And the resilience, the survival plot looks exactly the same. What about other kinds of structural barriers? In this country, we're trying to get every state to pass laws to put kids in preschool, because preschool is going to be a huge advantage and help these kids do better. Not in South Africa. And that can be all about quality of the preschool, but not in South Africa. You don't do any better. You're not more likely to be resilient. And if we look at other analyses we've done, you're not likely to do better at all based on either breastfeeding or preschool, which is not, again, what the liter literature would predict. We did do research that showed that Polani does change the entire community. So that in around um, 2016, these neighborhoods still have functioning programs in them. We picked up our sample in 2009 but we sent our recruiters through the neighborhoods in around 2016. The um, mentor mothers, the community health workers, are supposed to go to every house where there's a kid under the age of six. And they're supposed to do this wane and the screening and do nutritional rehab, HIV and alcohol counseling. Now they have that in depression. And so we did a cross-sectional way through these 24 neighborhoods. And what we found was that all the children, with all the kids under six, they were 1.5 times less likely to be underweight, two and a half times more likely, less likely to be severely underweight, that means malnourished, and um, a little less likely to be stunted. So that there's a community level effect that goes on seven years after we mounted this intervention. Well. Community is one thing, what about neighborhood? What about the features of the neighborhood? And remember that we had matched pairs. We had 12 matched pairs. We actually had six matched sets of four neighborhoods. And there's all kinds of literature that where you live matters. What's the rate of poverty in your neighborhood affects how kids do? How safe is your neighborhood versus what's the rate of violence? And we um, have, data that show that arrest rates varied from 14% in some of our clusters to 65% in other clusters. So neighborhoods varied in density. We controlled for that in our matching. But how do these kind of neighborhood factors like housing, employment, violence, healthcare access relate to resiliency? And what you find, we found six clusters that had really low prevalency, really low prevalence of resilient kids. 11% of the kids were resilient. And we had one cluster where 27% of the kids were resilient. What predicted those kinds of neighborhood differences? And it was things like formal housing, the number of shabims, although they were pretty standard across neighborhoods, the arrest rates, so that we know that neighborhood matters in predicting what percentage of kids will be resilient. Migration was another issue that we looked at, because one third of these families went to the Eastern Cape. And there really is no laser, right? If you look at this, what's important to, this, this is, the first column is Cape Town. So you can see over time, at six months, 85% of the kids are on track. They're still resilient by our definition. And half of them lose, something happens, either their behavior 
or their IQ or their growth is two standard deviations off. So then we only have half the kids resilient at 18 months. It's down to 7% at three years and 21% at five years. How could we get 21 at five years when we had fewer? It's where you live because this slide is about are you living in Cape Town or are you going to the Eastern Cape? So the next two columns show you go to the Eastern Cape with your mom. Who goes to the Eastern Cape? Kids who are doing badly. So that 95% at six months, but by 18 months, when if you're living in Cape Town, half of the kids are resilient. In the Eastern Cape, none, even if they're with their mom. And one kid is on track at 18 months in the Eastern Cape. About two-thirds of the kids that if you went to the Eastern Cape, your mom could either stay with you, your mom could stay with you, or she could leave, you leave you there. If your mom leaves you there, you're, you're a kid who's not doing well. Well, 85% are thriving here, 95% are if your mom's with you. Two out of 26 kids are okay if you, she leaves you with somebody. And it continues, 2%, 2%. Here you have more families migrating. So the possibility, as more and more families migrate, you get a, a, a better chance of being resilient. But basically, going to the Eastern Cape without your mom, dumping your kid, which is often happens because you have to work, you have nobody to take care of that child, it has to go to the grandparents. The worst situation, and because we've looked at this in a set of qualitative studies that I'm not gonna talk about, is if the mother leaves you with the father's family, then you are just an ignored child and you fail to thrive. So migration interacts with resiliency to influence who's gonna be resilient. Well, another question is, what happens if you started out low birth weight? You're already not resilient when you come out. You're somehow a low birth weight in infant. That's, 17, that's almost one in five kids, 17%. Those kids recover. Most of those kids recover at six months, almost two thirds. But by 18 months, it's only one in three. And by 60 months, it's 15% of the kids. So low birth weight, there's a lot of longitudinal research, including in low and middle income countries that shows if you're born low birth weight, you're in big trouble the rest of your life, and you're gonna be obese when you're older. And you see that here. But what you do see is that the survival curves are different for kids who were low birth weight, not being resilient compared to those who were, big, who, uh, were normal for weight and height at birth. So in terms of structural factors, what we see is neighborhood matters, home visiting doesn't matter, preschool doesn't matter, and migration matters. These are the kind of questions that if we wanna begin to look at resiliency, that we have to think about layered interventions that are developmentally timed um, throughout a culture. So where are we going from here? We got the 90-month data, but in fact, we have another randomized control trial. The kids just turned 13. It's called the Alifa Labadwana. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's, not, it's called something else. That's the funder, Alifa Labadwana. But um, what we found was that more and more intervention effects are kind of the average mean effect but there have now been three or four intervention studies that show if you have this serotonin marker on one of your chromosomes, that in fact the intervention means much, much more. And in a study of attachment that was led by one of my colleagues, Mark Tomlinson, who's the primary collaborator on this study, what they found was, a, came out in PLOS Medicine a while ago, that they found a much bigger intervention effect for kids who had this marker. So we've been collaborating with Pascal Ferron from uh, University of London. 
and um, we are going to try to do genetic markers on these kids. And we want to know, how are these kids going in school? So they're just finished second grade, and they're predominantly in enough classrooms that we could get to these classrooms in these schools and give a cheer achievement and peer ratings. And we have a talented postdoc who wants to look at both EEG that can be used both for cognitive functioning but also for measuring bonding in real world field settings. And so we're gonna be applying for that. But the fun news is that we get to do the evaluation since we started collaborating with them and by their report, it's on the basis of the fact that they have empirical results. We've actually done three studies and we have more data than these that I'm presenting today. But this program has been diffused to four African countries, Swaziland, Lesotho, I'm never gonna get it right, two other rural communities in South Africa. But um, as of about three months ago, Sweden is implementing this program with all its million refugees for all families with um, new into the country, and there's one million of them. It's funded by the Church of Sweden and the Swedish government. The second theme, though, that I kind of like to reflect on is that this is something that I've been writing about for a long time. All these evidence-based interventions, nobody's using them. And it doesn't look any better today than it did before. So we did not create one manual and train people to implement that manual and to go out and do a sequenced set of activities and scripts. And none of our randomized controlled trials in the last 10 years have done that. We've gone to a model where we think, we look at Bruce Chirpita's work and we say there are foundational elements. All of evidence-based interventions are currently based on cognitive behavioral theory. You gotta understand that theory and we teach it in one sentence. People change slowly over time in relationships with practice and rewards. Changing that one sentence into learning how to do cognitive behavior therapy, that's a challenge. In LA, we, tried to, we were funded for replication here um, by Kellogg Foundation, and then we went to do a large randomized controlled trial, and we couldn't. In the $200 million of tobacco money that at the time LA was getting, there was no agency that had more than two paraprofessional community health workers. If you only have two people funded, you can't hire a supervisor, you don't have good monitoring systems, you can't do random site visits, and the average, there was just a huge national failure to replicate paraprofessional home visiting, and it's a trial that had been going on like 10 years, and it was a failure. The average amount of training that we do for paraprofessionals in this country is one week, who we're sending out to do training. We estimate it takes about nine months to make a good home visitor, but that's not how we're investing in these services. So we train people in these foundational elements, then the domains are linked to whatever population we're doing, and then we allow, and we have some messages, they gotta get the messages, and everything is monitored by mobile phone, so everybody gets dashboards. I can watch home visitors walking around South Africa in my office. Maybe not me personally, because I'm technologically challenged, but staff. <laughs> and we can monitor what skills did you use today? Did you praise people? Did you give information? Did you set up a goal? Did you tell them how to talk to themselves? And what content area did you use? And what we're finding in our data and our content process analysis, content matters, skill doesn't. Could be that they don't rate them right, but, but what you say, the content of what you say matters. And all of our studies use these integrated assessment intervention strategies um, that we've been using everywhere. But it's a different approach to how you might deliver evidence base but not in the way that our current standards predict that we should do them. 
So just to show you um, where is it going from here, we're doing another, we're funded by NIMH, we're in the middle, near the end actually, of another randomized controlled trial with these too many health workers in a deeply, deeply place in the Eastern Cape. And um, the government hires 65,000 community health workers. And in the Eastern Cape, I was meeting with the Minister of Health, and they go, you know, the, the, it was a woman, you know, Polani interviews the woman that they hire to be the community health worker. It was a very novel idea. And while we couldn't hire who we wanted, what we did was take whoever the government has already hired, and one woman says, I don't know about this training. You know I have a bar to run. And this is a system that's not used to accountability. And we put in supervisions. We trained everybody, whether you're in the intervention or control. And we put in supervision systems. And we're going to know probably in another year and a half, um, is that enough to train, supervise, and the lawsuits that have come because they also, they fire people. It's just an atypical concept in many low and middle income countries. To, to make sure that you know, these same principles of intervention and the same look at resiliency we're working on domestically. So we currently are one of the program projects of the Adolescent Trials Network. There's three studies, um, one on acute infection, where we've found so far, I think it's uh, 19 acutely in HIV infected kids. You might have seen today on the front page of the New York Times that there's a possibility of a cure. This is a cure study. Nobody has any adolescents that are acutely infected. We've identified 56 kids in the last 18 months. We have an HIV positive youth intervention. We have 128 up to 120 and an HIV negative youth study led by Dallas here, the analytic core led by um, Scott Camulata in our department. So these three studies are a large program project. To give you an idea, this is who the federal government thought were not important. It's 88% African American and Latino. 40% have been hospitalized for mental illness. 40% have been in jail. 62% um, have been homeless in the last year. 62% test positive for opioids on the baseline assessment. 25% have an active STI. This is a rip-roaring sample. But the same intervention is used across all populations, that all the data are integrated and collected via mobile phone. The data systems are integrated for both assessment and intervention. And um, we can look at over time both, and we're agnostic. We're not into designing apps. We're into making standardized functions. And then we have interpersonal coaching, which is kind of the, just the same thing that you heard about for community health workers. So where does this leave as a take home message? Resiliency requires layered interventions that are structural, sustained over time, and with novel approaches to how we're going to diffuse, design and diffuse our approach to evidence base. And for what I see that I need, it reminds me of when I was, I was taking a walk on the beach the other day. And I looked up and there was a guy in a hot air balloon. And he, he calls down to me and goes, hey, hey you, where am I? And I looked up and said, oh, you're a policymaker. And he goes, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't even tell a joke. He goes, where am I? And I go, oh, you're about 200 feet above the ground, vertically suspended in the air with no, possible, no visible means of descent. And the guy goes, you must be a researcher. And I go, yeah, how did you know? And wait a minute, I have to look up the joke. <laughs> Oh, you're full of technically correct information that is totally irrelevant to my current situation. And I go, oh, you must be a policymaker. And he goes, how'd you know? 
you go, uh, you don't know where you are, you don't know what to ask to find out where you are, and you're blaming other people for your current situation. <laughs> so we, I hope that this presentation is not full of technically correct information, totally irrelevant to our daily lives. Um, but I want to stop here and thank not only you, but also all the mothers, children, and families who've shared their lives with us over the last 25 years. Thank you. Uh, my question was um, regarding the women who were identified as being antenatally depressed. Um, around um, average, what gestational age were they sort of first encountered? And, um, and what, if any, treatment was offered to them when they were recognized to meet diagnostic criteria for depression? They were 26 weeks, and no treatment was offered because none is available. So we can say that we have tried to implement such protocols. And most recently, we have a cohort of 950 young men under the age of 30, of which, um, a, stunningly, about 50% meet the caseness criteria on a CESD measure for major depressive disorders. Um, we've had one suicide and 14 deaths. And the suicide was for, we, have been triaging, and then we had to hire a full-time social worker to try to triage and get services for the young men who are so clinically depressed. And we couldn't do it. And so the young man that killed himself um, had been in a psychiatric hospital up to the previous Sunday, was seen both by our team and by their clinician the day before he killed themselves. And there was nothing anybody could do. There were no inpatient beds. There were no resources. So while we might refer for antenatal depression, now all the staff, they're part of a, a large, another large, by a different collaborator, uh, randomized controlled trial. And in fact, the results are done, Crick Lund, out of the University of Cape Town. And it had no effect. It was a classic CBT intervention done with pregnant women. So I think that the approaches, I, I would question more and more some of the approaches, especially in low and middle income countries, that you're going to get women to follow a script, good luck. We can't do it in our country, and how we would think that we would do it in a low and middle income country is fantasy land. Hi. When you were looking at the resiliency trends among location and also for low birth date infants, I noticed that at three years of age, there was a crash across all four groups. Can you please explain why that might be? Was there maybe a change in the assessment or in the instrument used? Um, what we think is, so we had a study that came out in social science and medicine, and Carol Worthman, a medical anthropologist, was one of the collaborators on this study out of Emory. So we did interviews with the mothers about parenting beliefs. And mothers think, when is it important for your kids? When are you important for your kids? When they're adolescents. That's when it matters about what I do and how I do it when I'm a mother. And there's, a, um, in this country, we're in the middle of uh, a belief system, especially among middle class parents. What I do matters, and I can shape my kid to be smart and successful and this and all these other things. We have helicopter parents. And that, in South Africa, there's a firm belief in the natural unfolding, genetic unfolding. So as soon as you're um, ambulatory, when kids can walk at a year old, you go out in the morning and you come back at the end of the day. You're with older siblings. You're with kids in the neighborhood. You're, um, and especially once you could talk, and save food, even though you don't have really good skills, you're on your own, is what the way I would read it. If I, when I go to the Christmas parties and they have one of these, you know, big bouncy things, I, these kids are pouring over the top, like they're doing a bunch of things in this country. This is dangerous, 
and I'm like stopping kids and I'm holding them up and I'm grabbing kids by the waist and pulling them down. Nobody's watching these kids until there's a serious screaming injury and then everybody turns around to watch. There's a, a confidence in the natural unfolding in that country in parenting that we don't have here. And that's, I think that what happens is the kids get better, but basically you are on your own. Kids don't, there's not breakfast. Kids eat when the mother's hungry. And even among the coordinators in the Polani program, these positive role models, when was the first meal? Around one o'clock in the afternoon. It's, it's when I'm hungry, then I realize you must be hungry and I feed you. So I think there's a very different belief system that goes on that has developmental consequences at around it by age three. Thank you so much. Oh, is this the last one, Dr. Martyr? Maybe. Um, I so appreciate the emphasis you kind of place on structural factors, both in understanding and also in terms of intervention. I'm wondering, given the very recent history of the apartheid in South Africa, to what extent or how you think about the direct and, in, and, and indirect impacts of racism um, on many of these factors, including parenting styles. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm sure it's huge. Realize that almost all of these mothers and kids, these are the born free generation. And so um, I, I can't answer that well, but racism is alive and strong. And uh, I, where I see it the most is with the men. The men physically and by their, there's no pathway out of poverty for these men. We're doing a randomized controlled trial. They play soccer three days a week and on the weekend, and they get vocational training and uh, we do drug testing out on the soccer field. And there's huge esprit de corps. Substance use rates plummet. But then when you, the whole country shuts down for about six weeks at Christmas, during Christmas, everybody drinks the same. It's a binge culture. There's nothing for men to do but drink in the shabins. And so we were actually had a fundable score to set up a family wellness center, similar to what we had in the family commons. But the Fed said, mm, not an infectious disease, we're not funding it, even though it was fundable. And unless we start thinking structurally, in this country, what you see are midnight basketball, girls and boys clubs, YMCA, this kind of infrastructure coming into low-income communities to give people pathways and options to, to choose good things to do. These men choose good things to do but the moment you're not there, there's nothing for you to choose. And the women turn to their kids. But they're pretty inspiring. Much like uh, Ariana, I, I was stunned by the drop off. You know, when you looked at that sort of Western country, uh, In the data sets that we look at are much more around nutrition. Where the, you see the longitudinal data sets, it's around nutrition and growth. Um, very few have cognitive measures or behavioral measures. And so the drop off is around 18 months. They would not, the other studies that do have IQ measures don't have those kids looking normal. Uh, our kids look mainstream normal at 18 months. Other countries, the impact is before that. Um, and so this is atypical. But given, you know, we started off with brand new community health workers, and we trained them, and they went to the field. I would never do that again if I wanted to do a study. They should have been out in the field nine months, given what we believe. And I think, it spe I think what's really critical, we're proposing a, uh, to add something, a randomized control trial and pick up a control group. Um, to this sample, but new control groups. Because unless you have sequenced interventions, like a preschool with a quality that matters. I've visited preschools all over the Eastern Cape. Like, basically, it's a shack about this big to the wall, and you might have 20 kids in there. And 
you know, the food could be, it's rice from a communal thing if you're lucky, and maybe there's orange aid. And um, you have, and the more heartbreaking is to watch, right? we're in the Eastern Cape and you're watching these little kids, they're carrying their chairs over the ridge going to school. They're carrying their chairs and the morning they go, oh, what's that? Why are these kids carrying chairs? Oh, they're going to school. Then an hour later, here come the kids carrying the chairs back home. I go, what happened? What are these kids doing? Oh, the teacher didn't show up. In systems without accountability, where it doesn't matter if you don't show up, the, it, it has huge consequences on the kids. If we were running businesses, if this was private enterprise, such things wouldn't be allowed. These are normal processes going on in these countries. And so implementation science or helping public sector organizations acquire the same norms and values about accountability and supervision is a key job in these countries.